Okay. Um, Wednesday, any questions before we get started? We're going to keep going with C decal calling convention. Oh. All right. Cool. So, why do we need a calling convention? Compatibility so that we can call functions written by other people and compiled by other programs. Yeah. Uh, what else? Why? So cross programs. What else? Yeah. Uniformity between programs, maybe across OSs. Maybe there's a program that supports either or. Yeah. So we could uh, maybe think about being able to <coughs> compile to our C code to different calling conventions, different architectures. Right, we need to know what these calling conventions are. And so, in the Linux, we're gonna focus on and study x86 Linux calling convention called cdecl, that's what it's called. So, when you look at your programs, this is exactly what they're using to call all the functions in your programs. So, the responsibilities, right, and this is what is spelled out in this convention. This convention says, okay, if you wanna call a function, what do you have to do? You have to do X, Y, and Z in this order. And if you are called as a function, you need to do X, Y, and Z. This is your responsibility. <coughs> so the caller first does what? You're designing this. What should functions have to do? Or sorry, what does somebody who wants to invoke a function have to do? Figure out where the location of the function is. Yeah, so the uh, uh, technically the linker will take care of that. So when we compile our code, it says, hey, I want to call this function. Then the linker, before it creates an executable, it says, oh, this function, I'm going to put it at this memory address. So in the code, we'll see a call memory address, not call name. But that's actually resolved essentially at compile time or at linking time. So what else? So that's already done. So the code has a call this function. But what does that have to do before it actually calls there? For what? Can you call a function? Ooh, possibly. Call function. Right, so somebody has to allocate space for the function. What else has to happen? Update base pointer. Update the base pointer, so we have to update the base pointer. What else? Arguments need to go on the stack. We need to, the arguments need to be somehow so passed. Somehow. Yeah, somehow we need to pass the arguments to the function. Uh, let's see, is there anything else? Save the current pointer. Uh, save the base pointer. So yeah, we talked about save the base pointer. Somebody has to um, save the base pointer. So specifically in, and these things, who does what is essentially arbitrary, right? That's what I want you to think about. But the point is we need a convention that we all agree on. And we say, yes, this is what we're going to use. So for here, first, the caller pushes arguments onto the stack in right to left order. So the very first thing pushed onto the stack is going to be the rightmost argument. And then the second thing onto the stack will be the second to rightmost argument, and so on and so forth, until we get the last argument, which is the leftmost argument. Does this make sense that this is the first thing that the caller has to do? Hey, Siri. That would work with your phone. I'm worried it would work with mine. Oh, it says Siri not to because I turned off the Wi-Fi. So why does it make sense to do this first? Why can't the called function do this? It might not have assigned the arguments yet. Yeah, it's like you are calling a function, you are passing in arguments to the function, right? So I mean, I guess you could develop this super weird way where the function that gets called somehow knows what the arguments are, but you know, we need to give those arguments to the function. And we don't want to yet call the function because it doesn't have any arguments yet. So we, the very first thing we do is set up the stack correctly with arguments. Then we put what you can think of as a breadcrumb, and we'll see how this comes into play later. We're going to push the address of the instruction after the call. Why do we do this? 
Yeah, so that the function that we call knows how to come back to us. Right? It just can't magically happen. Right? We have to actually invoke this function. The CPU just keeps executing things, whatever the instruction pointer says it should execute. And it needs to know how does it go back? Where does it go back to? And that's it. So calling functions is actually fairly easy. We push arguments onto the stack, and then, as we'll see, there's actually one x86 instruction that takes care of this, pushing, pushing the address of the instruction after the call. <coughs> so now the function gets called. Now what does it have to do? Everything else, right? I mean, we saw that, OK, th this is what the caller has to do. We have to have some kind of invention. We have to do everything else. So we have to save the previous function's base pointer, frame pointer. Do we have to save it onto the stack? No. That's actually a harder question than I thought. Ideally, no, but then the question is where else would you put it? Right? You need to store it somewhere. You can't store it at a fixed offset because then if your function gets called again, it will overwrite that. It's the same thing. It's essentially a local variable. You could maybe store it in a file somewhere. It doesn't matter as long as you put it back before you return. So you need to save the previous frame's base pointer. So now what does the stack look like at this point? pointer of where we're going to go to, and then arguments, right? Perfect. Then we need to create our space for our local variables. So now we create space on the stack for our local variables. And remember what we have to do, as we continue executing, it better be the case that the stack is consistent when we return. So where does that mean the stack should be pointing to when we return? Yeah, so it should be right there at that. We'll see exactly where it's going to be. But yes, in essence, we need the stack to be returned at exactly the same point that we left it. And we put the return value in the EAX register, right? This is part of the reasons why we call functions, so we get return values from them. And the convention states that the return value gets put into the EAX register. Questions? It is the, uh, it's a register, general purpose register. Um, the E stands for extended. So is it just allocated different, um, on, in different operating systems? Yes. So on some, some, some calling conventions, you put the return value on the stack. Some calling conventions, it's in a different register. So it just all depends. Yes? Wouldn't you also need to push some of the saved um, registers <coughs> onto the stack so that they can be corrected? Yes, so I neglected to leave, I, I left that part out um, because I don't want to get too in depth. But yes, there are certain registers that are, that the, uh, a function that we call can overwrite and do whatever they want with. And there's some registers that we're supposed to save. And so we have to do that in there. So the compiler would make sure about doing that. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds there. Yeah. So how, that's a good question. How would it? So you're calling a void function, and your compiler's writing this code for the first part to call the function. What does it do with that return value? What was that? <coughs> it still puts some values in the register, but we never use it. It could put values in that register. It shouldn't, because I mean, it can change that register EAX. It could put values in there, but we've already said that's a void function, right, based on the type. So A, our compiler shouldn't allow us to assign the return of a void function to a variable. So we're never going to use it. We're just going to ignore it. Right? <coughs> it's that code that we write is going to do that. So the other case to think about is what happens when a function does return something, but we don't use it. Same thing. This function has no idea that we don't use the return value. It just puts it in EAX. And the compiler never generates code to read from that EAX register. Yes? As, as 
you pointed out last time, if if my return value is float, then it's different. I don't remember exactly how. You have to look at the spec. Yes. Also, if you return a struct, right? You can return structs. Those could be arbitrarily huge sizes. It's in the spec somewhere. If you look cdecl, I'm sure the Wikipedia page would say somewhere. I think in that case you put it on the stack. But the important thing is both the function that's being called and the caller function know what to do in that case, right? And it can know because it has the type signature of the function. And it says, aha, this function's returning something that's more than four bytes. That means I shouldn't look in EAX, I should look on the stack. So the important thing is that you can establish all this information beforehand, <coughs> right? When you're compiling the code. Cool. Any other questions here? All right. All right, let's go through an example. So now we have a main function. We have an integer a. We're calling some function, call e, passing in 10 and 40. And then we're returning a from main. Then in our function call e, we take in two integers and returning a plus b plus 1, right? Very simple function. You can all step through this, see exactly how it executes, I hope. So what would main return? What value does main return? Okay, there you go. Took a long time there, guys. <laughs> Okay, 51. 40 plus 10 plus 1. Yeah. Three, two additions. Okay, so when we compile this code, we can then see the exact x86 code that our compiler generates. So we can see that main, it compiles it as first push EDP. So what is it doing? Right, it's completing its part of the calling convention, right? The function, what every single function has to do is save the previous base pointer, right? So we save, we push the previous function's base pointer that called us, we save that on the stack. We then move the stack pointer to the current base pointer. So what does this do? Yeah, it's that our base pointer, right? For our function, our base pointer is gonna be wherever the current stack is. Then we're creating our space on our stack. So here we're doing, uh, we're subtracting, what's 18? I just tried to do it in my head and I failed. 24. 24, is that correct? Cool, I see some nodding, so that's good. But nobody wants to check. So moving down 24 bytes, that seemed like a lot. How many bytes does main, how many bytes of local variables does main use? How many bytes? Four bytes. <coughs> and yet we're reserving 24. You mentioned something last class about a fixed value being um, reserved dependent on your Yeah. Um, we'll actually see why. It's because compilers are tricky, is the short answer. Um, we'll see it in a second. So then now we're moving hex value. Hex 28, which is going to be what? 40 onto where? ESP plus 4. So it's going to be 4 above the stack pointer. Then we're moving 10 <coughs> onto where the current stack pointer is. And then we're going to call the call E function. Right? So now why did I take 24 bytes? What did I have to do if I wanted to call the call E function? What's the very first thing I have to do? Push the arguments onto the stack. What am I doing here? Yeah, but I'm not really pushing, right? Because I've already allocated that space with that subtraction. And then I'm just moving this into ESP plus 4 and moving this directly at ESP. So that, when this function is called, the first thing on the stack there is the leftmost argument, which is going to be 10. And the one above that is going to be 40. We'll see when we see it all laid out. Then, when we're done, we move EAX into EDP minus 4. What is EDP minus 4? Yeah, the local variable A. Right? It was never initialized before, so we didn't see it. 
right? But now we're moving. So E of X now has what? Answer. Yes, the return of call E, right? So we move that into A, and now we need to move E to P minus 4 into E at X. Why do we do that? Yeah, we're doing we're compiling this return A. Right? That translates directly and move that back there. We can see because we're humans looking at this that this is redundant. Right? But the compiler needs to be very precise. If you don't enable any optimizations, it's going to do what it knows is correct without any kind of optimization. Alright, so then and then we'll see what the lead function does. And then we have a return. Cool. So we call these bits at the top the prologue. So this push EBP, so save the EBP, move the stack pointer into the current base pointer, and create space for local variables, these have to be done for every single function. Right? This is not functionality that's specific to main. Every <coughs> function has to do this. So we call this the function prologue. And afterwards, we have the function epilogue. So this leave and return, you can think of it, we'll step through it in a second do the opposite of these things. So that, that way the stack is all 100% all good when we leave. And every function will have these. <coughs> cool, so if we look at the call e function, we have push EDP, same thing, right? We, have to, we don't know who's calling us, we have to save their base pointer. We then have to move the current stack pointer into the base pointer to set up our own base pointer. Then we move EBP plus C into EAX. What's EBP plus C? So what do we do? So right before this function is called, what does the stack look like? Going, let's say, bottom up. So what's the first thing on the stack? The return address, right? It has to be the return address of where we go. And then above that, what is it? Parameters. The parameters, which is in this case what? 40 and 50. In which 10 order? 10 and 40. 10 and 40. Yeah. <coughs> so then the very first thing we do is push EDP. Right? So now we have save EDP, save EIP, 1040. Then we move the current base, the current stack pointer into the base pointer. So now the base pointer points right there. So now it's at EDP plus C. 10. 10, right? So Yes. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that'll be the second parameter, which would be B in this case. Moving that into EAX, then moving EBP plus eight, which is the first parameter A, into EDX. And now we have again this load effective address. So we're doing EAX times one, which is EAX plus EDX. Move that into EAX. So we're adding A plus B, then we add 1, <coughs> and then we do pop EDP and then return. So why didn't, so then what is this going to return? EAX, which is going to be the result of <coughs> B, B plus A plus 1. So what's different about the epilogues here in these two functions and why? And the prologues, let's say. First thing, are they the same? Why? What's different about call E than main? doesn't have any local variables, so why waste the time and the space to create space on the stack for something you know you're not going to need? Right? That's the only difference here. So here, this prologue does not create any space, and therefore the epilogue is slightly different to compensate for that fact. I still think you can use a lead, but we don't need to. Alright, so then let's look at this thing executing. So now we have call E in main. 
All right, and these are at, these are actual memory addresses that I took from a compilation of this function. And we'll notice here, so this is where, a, where the compiler put each of these variable, uh, sorry, where this code is located in memory, right? This code is just bits, bytes, right? And the CPU reads those bytes, interprets them as an instruction, executes it, and it goes on to the next one. So, for instance, this is why the linker, instead of having call callee here, right, it's saying call 804-8394, which is the address of callee, right? So this is what is actually going to be executed by our program. So we have our handy dandy stack, high, low. We have EAX, EDX, ESP, EDP, EIP. Um, these are all the registers that are used in this code. Uh, what is EIP? Instruction pointer. So it has the address of the instruction that we're going to execute. So when I ran this one time, the stack was at FD2D4, which means that the stack pointer had the value FD2D4 when we started. <coughs> and the instruction pointer is at main of 804.83a5. And let's say EDP was, is this right? Yeah. FD2C0, so some, somewhere above. No, it's wrong. That's below us. Doesn't matter. Some value, it should be above us, but for this example purposes, it doesn't matter. So, what am I doing here? Oh, okay. So, now we're going to execute. We're going to push EBP onto the stack. So, we first move our stack pointer down four bytes, and then we copy the value in EBP onto the stack push EBP, and now our instruction pointer now points to A6. So how many bytes is push EBP? One byte. Right? You can tell based on the <coughs> sense here. Now we move the current stack pointer, which is FD2D0, into the base pointer. So now we're setting up our base pointer and saying that now our base pointer points to here. Then we subtract 24 from the base pointer. So now, or from the stack pointer. So now we have all this saved space is our local variables and as we saw, also arguments that we're gonna to use to pass to this function. And our base pointer still points up here. Questions? Cool. Okay, now we're going to set up the call, right? Now we get to, we want to call this function, right? And remember, all of this code, these four lines here, map back to that one line of A equals call E 1040, right? And yet, there's a lot of instructions that has to happen in order to enable this function call. So, what happens? We move hex 28, which is 40, decimal 40, into ESP plus four, which is going to be here. Then we move 10 onto ESP. So now we've done exactly what we needed to do, right? We didn't necessarily push 40 and then 10 onto the stack, but we copied them to the right locations so that when we call this function, it's going to have the arguments of the function in if you're going from the bottom up, it's left to right. If you go from the top down, it's right to left. Does that make sense or is that just super confusing? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Question? Yes. So instead of moving in the offsets, why do you not just push them like in the order that you need? Like, is it a compiler? Yes, it's a compiler thing. I don't know. I honestly don't know why I decided to do that. Okay. I bet. It could be faster somehow to just reserve that space because this subtraction here, you know, instead of doing, uh, what would this be? Instead of doing sub 16 and then do another push push, maybe for whatever reason, maybe these are shorter instructions. So overall your code gets shorter. Ah, compiler code optimization is a crazy, crazy, like even the, I think the compiler people don't fully understand why it does certain things because there's, not only are you trying to optimize speed, right, but part of fast <coughs> code is code
code that is smaller, right? So you can do the same thing in the same number of bytes. Now you've cached more of your instructions. So your code should be faster because you're not pulling in all this code. But maybe it turns out that for certain CPUs, longer instructions are actually faster. So how do you balance that optimization and how do you do that? So they do a lot of profiling and they try to um, determine what's the best option. Cool. So now we get to this call instruction. So what's the difference between a call and a jump? What was that? You're coming back from the call. We're coming back from the call. So according to our calling convention, what do we have to do? Push the current uh, instruction button. Push which instruction? The next instruction. The next instruction, which is what? BF. Yeah. BF. Why the next instruction? Yeah, otherwise we keep going back to ourselves and doing this infinite call thing. I mean, I guess you could deal with that somehow, but it would be super annoying, right? Um, so yeah, so this is the difference in x86. Some architectures don't have a call instruction. You have to push the correct instruction onto the stack, and then you jump. But here we have a call instruction. So the call instruction does two things. It sets EIP to exactly this value that we have here of 804.83.94, and it pushes 804.83.bf onto the stack. So it does two things. It's actually kind of cool. So when we call this, we're going to push, move the stack four bytes down. We're going to copy 804.83bf onto the stack. And then we're going to jump and start executing here. So now we have a new function that gets called, right? And it has its epilogue. It says, I don't know who called me, but I have to save their base pointer. Right? So the very first thing it does is saves the base pointer, pushes that base pointer on. And then it sets up its own base pointer that says, OK, my base pointer is going to be here. So why can the compiler hard code the fact that B is at offset EDP plus C and A is at offset EDP plus 8? Number of parameters, I guess. So it's based on the number of parameters, right? So the first parameter. But why is the first parameter always at EDP plus 8? Yeah, because according to the calling convention, the person who called me must have put the arguments in order from left to right, or pushed in the order from right to left. So the closest to the top of the heap is going to be the first <coughs> argument. Then I know they must have pushed on the return instruction pointer, and I just pushed the base pointer onto there. And then I set this up as my new base pointer, so now I know 8 bytes above that is my first parameter. And 4 bytes above that is the second parameter. And 4 bytes above that is the third parameter. Yeah, sorry, I'm counting. Too many numbers. And that's why it's able to hard code this. So this is part of the thing. When you're looking at binary code, if you have negative offsets of the base pointer, you're looking at local variables. And if you're looking at positive offsets, you're looking at parameters which makes sense given the calling convention. OK, so then we move EDP plus C, which is B, into EAX. Oh, and so what we have on our stack, right, by looking at this, we can see that we have the callee's function frame, which includes all of its parameters. Right, This is everything that callee needs to do in order to execute. And then above that, we have main's function frame, which is everything that main needs to do. And this is what we use the stack, right? So as the callee called other functions, they would each get space on the stack for their own function frame. And then if we ever ended up calling main again, it would have a separate function frame on the stack. And so this is how we can have local variables for every function and local parameters for every function. Yes? We would still need to, we push technically the, it depends on how it was, would compile down. We're actually going to look, after this section, we're going to look at pass by value, pass by reference, pass by name, um, and see how that happens. But it's really just a compiler technique. In most, I believe in most pass by reference, you're essentially converting that into a pointer transparently. So you pass the address of something, 
into the function, and then instead of just accessing it normally, you dereference it. Cool. Okay. So we just moved, we're going to move 28 into EAX. We're going to move 10 into EDX. We're going to add them together to get 50. And then we're going to add one more to get 52, which is clearly 33. Now we need to clean up. So what do we have to do in our epilogue? Correct the base pointer of the caller. We need to return whoever called us their base pointer to the correct location. So that's exactly what happens next, right? We're popping the value that's on the stack into EBP. So that's going to put main's base pointer back, right? Because that was our job was to save it. So now we have to put it back before we return. Otherwise, we're a bad function. And we're not conforming to this calling convention. Then we need to do a return. So a return is basically, it's really, uh, you can think of it as the opposite of a call. And essentially what it does, actually exactly what it does, is pop EIP. So take the value currently on the stack, <coughs> pop it, and put it into the instruction pointer. So that means the next instruction you're executing from that instruction. So here, now the instruction pointer will be 804.83bf, <coughs> and our stack will have moved up four bytes. And now we go back here. Right? So from our function, from main's perspective, Everything's the same, right? The base pointer's the same. The stack is still in the same location as when it called it. Right? Everything's good. And we got a value in EAX. That value that we wanted from call E is in EAX. So now we can finish the rest of our job. We can move EAX back into EBP, or not back, but into EBP minus 4, which is going to be A. Then we move, again, EBP minus 4, which is A, into EAX. So leave is, you can think of it as the opposite of these three instructions. So it does two things. It first sets the current stack pointer to the current base pointer. So in essence, it gets rid of this sub 18. It doesn't matter what the stack is. It's going to be currently at the base pointer. Then it does an implicit pop EDP. So it takes the value that's currently on the stack here, FD2C0, and puts that into EDP. So you can see in call E, it only needed to do half of that. Right? It only needed to do pop EDP. That's why it used that, because there's no local variables. So this leave instruction is pretty complicated. It's going to move the stack pointer to the current base pointer, and then it's going to pop that base pointer, and so we're going to get FD2C0, whatever was on the stack there, into the base <coughs> pointer. And then finally, now we're going to return, and where are we going to return to? We don't know, whoever called us, right? We didn't draw that on the stack. But we'll return, and they'll do their stuff. Yes? So, uh, in the calling function, uh, when exactly pop and return happens? Uh, at the return statement, or the this uh, the curly braces in let's go back. here uh, no uh, in, in actual code in C code let's say I have written mm -hmm. uh, like we have written a plus b plus one yep. and that then there's a right curly brace right? yes so yep. the return statement will if you're returning a value it will set up that value so this this the fact that this value is in the EAX yeah, is that because is of the in return. EAX, but when exactly pop and return happens at the written statement itself, or it goes to write curly brace and then pop and return happens? Uh, there is no difference, right? There is no write curly brace doesn't mean doesn't compile to anything. Uh, That's I just a syntax. I can have a function which has multiple written statements. Yeah, so the first return it's going to return. So it'll probably compile it to a jump. So each of those returns will jump to that. They will set up whatever value, they'll put whatever value you're going to return into EAX. Then they will jump to the epilogue, which will do pop EDP return. So epilogue is located at the at right the usually the very screen. end of the function, yeah. And then all the exit points of the function will jump to that one location in the assembly. Cool. Okay. 
Now we get to a point where you get to choose your own education adventure. Uh, so I did this, I didn't get to do this last semester, this part, because we went not as fast as we're going now. Um, so I like where you guys are, so I think we have time to cover this. Uh, what I want to cover, so what I'd like to cover is a little bit of why this c decal calling convention, how this leads to security vulnerabilities like buffer overflows. And then walking through an example where we have a buffer overflow <coughs> and seeing how that blows stuff up. Um, so if I get a show of hands of like, yes, I would like to learn that. Sweet, all right. For those watching at home, everybody raised their hands. I think they raised, some of them raised two hands. It was overwhelming support. Okay, so, yes. Will the security thing be on the any measure in your We'll see. <laughs> yeah, too late. Is that democracy works? Yeah. Uh, so we can return only one thing because we have one register for that? Yes, we can only, well, so no, we can only return one thing because that is what C dictates. Right? C says each function only returns one thing. It can be a struct, which has multiple fields, but it is still only one thing. <coughs> so if you wanted to change the C to enable returning multiple values, you'd have to figure out a way to do that, and you may have to change this calling convention, which would break lots of stuff. So Python, Python's calling, calling convention has a different style. Yes. And they, Python also does not compile down to C code, right? But Python does have a foreign function interface that you can call C code from Python and it knows how to translate those stuff. But yeah, I think under the hood, you could maybe do it by like tuples, basically. Like you just, or structs. You could create like a custom struct for everything that you wanted to return, but it would be, it wouldn't be pretty, I don't think. It would be not easy. Okay, so as we just saw, right, when Colleen was called here, so, we just did pop, we're trying to return to whoever called us, right? On the stack we have that person's base pointer and that instruction pointer where to go execute, right? Does this code do any validation that says, yes, that base pointer that we saved for main is the proper base pointer? Does main do any checking to make sure that its base pointer wasn't is, wasn't different? Is there anything that prevents us from writing to the stack? No, here's proof. We're pushing things on here, right? The stack is writable memory. We can lift, that is the point. It is a stack. We are writing to it, right? So think about the base pointer. Now, what does this return instruction do? Pop something on the stack and jumps to it pops something <coughs> off the stack and just starts executing from it. Is there anything that states that this has to be exactly where we came from? No, there's no checks being done here. So think of it, how many of you know the story of Hansel and Gretel? Wow, I need to work on your fairy tales. Uh, okay, Hansel and Gretel, they were like little kids and they had this great idea of like, oh, we're gonna go play in the forest, but the forest is really scary. So what we'll do is we'll leave a trail of breadcrumbs like from our house into the forest. That way they can always find their way back, right? So they're going along, they like drop breadcrumbs every few feet. And that way when they're like super deep in the forest, they can always find their way back, right? And so that's the same way to think about these save VIPs, right? These are breadcrumbs that we're leaving through the stack that tells us how to go back. But just like we talked about, there's no reason that says that, hmm, what if I change this? Or what if I overwrite this? Or what if your program has a bug and I can control that? Now I can change where you and your breadcrumbs go, and I can trick you to go into the evil witch's house. I think they live, well, at least in the version I know, so don't feel too bad for them. OK. So we're going to look at what happens if they did. So we're going to look at this function. Um, we're going to waste some code. We have a my copy <coughs> function. We're copying the parameter string into a local buffer foo. How are local buffers allocated like this? Why am I calling it a buffer? Yeah, it's a local array. So I'm saying I want four bytes on the, and it's, because it's a local variable, it's going to be allocated on the stack. 
What are the semantics of string copy? Copy until you see a null byte. Yeah, copy from the source, which is string, into the destination, which is foo, until you see a null byte in string. Is there anything that limits the size of the bytes that I'm going to be copying? No. No. So I have my main function. You can see I used this a year ago. I clearly didn't update it. I actually just copied this right before class. OK. So we're going to call it like this. We're going to print after. We're going to return 0. So we can look at how this is compiled just the same, right? Push EVP, move the stack pointer to the turn base pointer, subtract 16 bytes for our local variables, move 804.8504 into ESP. What do we think this is? Well, then we're calling my copy, so what do we think this is? Yeah, it's where, right, the compiler has to put the string ASU space CSE space 340 space fall space 215 space rocks exclamation point and then the null byte. That has to exist somewhere in memory. And so the compiler just chooses, I'm going to put this at 804.8504. And so this is the address that it passes in. Then we're going to move 804.8517, which into EAX, move EAX onto the stack pointer, and then we're going to call printf. So what's this? What's at this address? What happens directly after calling? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I changed this to call. It should be my copy. So what happens right after we call my copy? Printf. We have a printf call. Right, so this is the string after, right? Because this is being passed as the parameter to after, and then we're moving zero into EAX, which then gets us our return zero, and we get a leave in return. So in the my copy function, just the same. We push EVP, we move the stack pointer to the current base pointer, we subtract twenty eight from the stack pointer, then we remove uh, EAX into uh, EVP plus eight. Wait, what? No. Oh, yeah, OK, duh, duh, duh. OK, right, EVP plus 8 is the parameter, the string, str. So we're moving that into EAX, then we move that into ESP plus 4. And then we are going to, now we get to our load effective address where it's actually loading an address and not doing addition. So we're taking e EBP and we're subtracting 4C from it. So this is an address. And we're moving that into EAX, then we're moving that onto the stack. So what's EVP minus C? <coughs> So the stack is currently here. The base pointer is somewhere else. The instruction pointer is currently at main. I'm going to walk through this a little quickly since we just did this. We're going to push the base pointer, move the current base pointer to the current stack pointer, subtract 16 from the stack pointer. Then we're going to move 804.8504 onto the stack. Then we're going to call my copy, right? And remember, calling pushes the address that we want to return, 804.8423. Now we push EVP, so we're going to save main's base pointer. We're then going to move the current stack pointer to the current base pointer. We then have to subtract, what did we say 28 was? Did we already say that? No. A lot? We'll go with a lot. Into ESP. Hex 28. I guess that's the easy way to say it, right? So it's hex 28. Then we move EVP plus, so this is EVP, EVP plus 4, EVP plus 8 which is 804.8504, which is the address of that string that we passed in. We're going to move that into EAX. Then we're going to move that onto the stack pointer plus 4. Right? So once again, right to left, this we're doing string copy. String copy, foo, comma, str. So the rightmost parameter is 804.8504. Then we're moving. Uh, okay, so we did that. Now we're moving EVP minus C. 
And remember, the load effective address means we are calculating what is the current value in EDP minus C. We're not dereferencing that value. Professor, uh, yes. uh, why are we doing two statements for uh, moving 08 EDP to ESB? First putting it in EAX and then... Like this? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. It's a compiler thing? Compiler, yeah. It did it and it's correct. Uh, okay, so then we get the effective address into EAX, so we get FD2AC, which is right here, so it's, uh, it's 12 bytes down from our base pointer, and we know that that's a local variable because it's a negative offset. Then we're moving that onto the stack pointer. So now we're calling string copy, and we're saying, hey, copy the string that's at 804.8504 at, into FD2AC. And so string copy is stupid. I mean, it's supposed to be stupid, right? It does exactly what it says it does in the man page. It says, I'll keep copying from source to destination until I get a null byte in destination in source. So we call string copy. So what is it going to do in there? It's going to copy ASU. So starting at FD2AC, it's going to first copy ASU space, right? And you got to remember, it's a little tricky. Um, I believe I did this correct. You'll notice if you look at the bytes, we have space, I think this is USA, right? 61 is A. So it's reverse order when you look at it as an int. Why? Because it pushed on the stack. No. What was that? Yeah, the Indianness, right? x86 is little Indian. So when we're copying byte by byte, we are literally copying the first byte here, A, at FD2AC. And then the next one at FD2AB, is that right? No, we're going higher, so it'll be D, AD, right? We're copying up the stack. Okay. So we do 61, 73, 75, 20. So we're going to copy the bytes up that way. Um, and if you looked at that as an integer, you could look at it as the strongest in that. Anyways. Then we copy CSU space, and we just keep going, right? String copy has no qualms about where it's supposed to copy. It copies here, copies here, copies here, copies here, copies here. And then <coughs> technically it would also copy a null byte into this next thing here because it would copy the null byte over. Um, so then it returns. We get back. We then call leave. What does leave do? Uh, remove the subtraction. So. so it removes the subtraction. So it sets the current, um, it sets the current stack pointer to the current base pointer. So it's going to change the base pointer to be 2B8, which is the same. No, what? Oh, and then it's going to pop. So then it's going to pop EDP. So it's going to put 6C, 6C, 6166 into the base pointer. 6C, 6C, 6166. Then we're going to call the leave instruction. So where are we going to start executing? Uh, 30, uh, 31. Yeah, so it'll be 31, 30, 32, 20. So we're going to, the CPU will try to access an instruction there and try to execute from there. Um, that, I would say that is highly unlikely to actually be a real instruction, so that will fail. We'll get a seg fault and our program will terminate. Um, and so I can run this, I can get a seg fault, I can run it in GDB. And it'll say it's starting, and it'll say that it got a seg fault because it was trying to access 3130, 3220. And I can look at all the registers here, and I can see that, yep, the base pointer had the value 6C, 6C, 6166. So the idea is that an attacker can overwrite and change that save EIP value, especially with very vulnerable C functions <coughs> that don't take in sizes. Right? All C arrays have to have sizes, right? C strings are zero terminated strings. They have to have sizes. But if I copy from a string that's potentially unbounded or is very large into a buffer that's smaller, I'm likely to overwrite memory addresses. Um, so in this one, we just caused it to crash. But if we could control that 31, 30, whatever those bytes were, we could make the program execute wherever we wanted and do whatever we wanted to do. Um, and so there are lots of other techniques to take this to get full execution, but using this, 
these as basic building blocks you can fully execute and take control of a program. Uh, this is one of the most common vulnerabilities in C and C++. They're still finding buffer overflow vulnerabilities today on modern C and C++ code. So, cool. Questions?